Hey, hey, it's Beata and David from BA English Coaching and welcome to our chapter three, day three of our six day reading challenge. So we are reading In the Sea There Are Crocodiles by Fabio Geta. And uh, so we are hoping you are enjoying reading with us. And the purpose is that you will feel connected uh, with the characters, with the story, with the book. I don't know about you, but I do already feel kind of connected. And um, David, what can you tell us about this? Like, do you when you read? Do you like reading? I love reading. Reading is one of my passions in life, and um, I think when you read a book, you enter a completely different world, and it's absolutely wonderful if you really get into that story mm -hmm. and enjoy it. Okay. And do you agree with what I said that you should? feel connected with the characters? Absolutely. I think um, if you think of the word empathy, empathy means that you uh, imagine that you adopt another personality or another persona, and mm. you can really enjoy uh, getting more engaged with that character and that story, and that's the way to get the most out of your reading. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you, David. So you will have a different accent today, <laughs> so you will have a different practice. Uh, please read with us fluently. Uh, try to, um, you know, uh, uh, copy David's expression, stress, rhythm, speed, and mainly pronunciation. And as we discussed last week, or last lesson, last session, there are three rules to extensive reading, and they are enjoy, enjoy, and enjoy. So we hope that you will be able to enjoy with that. You will enjoy the reading with us. And at the end of this session, I will give you a very simple assignment that will help you um, get closer and get connected with the main characters. So I think we are ready to start. Okay. So we are reading chapter three and we are starting on page 93. So we are in Iran now, and Fabi, uh, Fabio and uh, Anayat has a job, but he has a different job uh, from Sufi. Sufi works at a different place. So chapter three, Iran, page 93. Okay, here we go. There were rumors going around that Isfahan wasn't safe anymore, and nor was Baharistan, because the police had received orders to repatriate everyone. So I called Sufi at the stone cutting factory in Qom, and he told me that for the moment, things were quiet there. That was when I decided to join him. I waited for Kaka Hamid to get back and said goodbye to him, collected my things and went to the bus station. How can you just change your life like that, Anayat? Just say goodbye one morning. You do it, Fabio, and that's it. I read somewhere that the decision to emigrate comes from a need to breathe. Yes, it's like that, and the hope of a better life is stronger than any other feeling. My mother, for example, decided it was better to know I was in danger far from her, but on the way to a different future, than I know I was in danger near her but stuck in the same old fear. When I got on the bus, I sat down at the back alone, holding my bag tight between my legs. I hadn't made any arrangements with anyone, any trafficker, I mean, because I didn't want to pay money again to someone to get me to a destination where there were no problems. And after all, when I'd been to Khom before to see Sufi, Everything had gone smoothly. It was a lovely day, and I curled up in my seat, my head against the window, ready to doze off. I had bought an Iranian newspaper. I thought that if we were stopped by the police and they saw me sleeping peacefully with an Iranian newspaper on my lap, they would think I was clean. Next to me was a girl in a veil, wearing a nice perfume. Three minutes later, we left. We were almost halfway. Two women were chatting to the girl next to me, 
talking about a wedding they had been to. And a man was reading a book while a little boy sitting next to him, who could have been his son, was quietly singing a little song, a kind of tongue twister. We were almost halfway, like I said, when the bus slowed down and came noisily to a halt. I thought it must be sheep. What's going on? I asked. I couldn't see anything on my side. An old block, the girl replied. Talisia sang Safid. The bus driver pressed a button and the doors opened wide with a hiss. Centuries passed. The air was still. Nobody spoke, not even those who had nothing to fear because they were Iranians or because their papers were in order. Then the first policeman got on. He didn't seem to be in any hurry. He had one arm of his sunglasses in his hand, the other in his mouth. When the police get on a bus, they don't ask everyone for their papers. They know perfectly well who's Iranian and who isn't. They're trained to recognize Afghans, illegals, and so on. As soon as they see one, they go straight to him and demand to see his papers, even they know perfectly well he doesn't have any. I had to become invisible, but that wasn't one of my powers. <laughs> I pretended to be asleep because when you sleep, it's as if you aren't there. And also because pretending to sleep is like pretending everything's all right and things will work out. But this policeman was a smart one and he saw me even though I was asleep. He tugged at my sleeve. I kept pretending to sleep and even shifted a bit in my sleep, which I tend to do during the night. The policeman kicked me in the shin. At that point, I woke up. Come with me, he said. He didn't even ask me who I was. Where? He didn't reply. He looked at me and put on his sunglasses, even though it was quite dark inside the bus. I picked up my bag. I apologized to the girl next to me and asked if she could let me through. And as I passed her, I got an even stronger whiff of her perfume. Everyone watched me as I walked down the aisle and I could feel their eyes burning into the back of my neck. As soon as I stepped down onto the ground, the bus closed its doors with the same pneumatic hiss as before and set off without me. There was a small police station with a car parked outside it. Tilizia, Song Safid, drums in the night. Talisia sang Safid. I can pay, I said immediately. I can pay for my repatriation. I did in fact have money with me that I'd earned on the site. But for some reason, they wouldn't listen to me. One of the policemen, a huge Iranian, passed me through, a, pushed me through a door. For a fraction of a second, I imagined a torture chamber caked with blood and strewn with fragments of bone, a deep well filled with skulls, a pit going down into the bowels of the earth, little black insects crawling over the walls and then acid stains on the ceiling. What was inside? A kitchen, that's what. Mountains of filthy plates and pots waiting to be washed. Get down to work, said the huge Iranian. The sponges are over there. It took me hours to win the battle against the remains of sauce and cake rice. I don't know how many years those pots had been there waiting for me. As I was washing the cutlery and plates, four other Afghan boys arrived. When we'd finished the, in the kitchen, they took all five of us and set us to work loading and unloading cars and vans and so on. Whenever there was a boot or a trailer to be checked, the policeman called us and we started emptying it. When they'd finished their checking, they called us again. There were crates and suitcases to be put back, boxes to be stacked, and so on. I stayed there for three days. Whenever I was tired, I sat down on the ground with my back against the wall and my head on my knees. If someone arrived, and there was unloading and loading to be done, 
a policeman would come and kick us and say, Wake up. And we would get up and start again. On the evening of the third day, they let me go. I don't know why. The four other boys stayed there and I never saw them again. I got to Hom on foot. Hom is a city with a population of at least a million, I found out later. But if you counted all the illegals in the stone cutting factories, I think the number would be double that. There are stone cutting factories everywhere. Thanks to Sufi, I started working in the same factory where he worked. There were 40 or 50 of us. They put me in the kitchen. I made meals and did the shopping. Unlike Isfahan in Khom, I was the only one to leave the factory in order to do the shopping, which was very, very risky for me, but something I couldn't get out of. Apart from the cooking, I washed and cleaned the factory manager's office. And if there was anything else to do, like standing in for workers who were ill or moving stuff, they would call me. Ino, they would shout. Sometimes they would just call without turning round, as if I was already there in front of them. And if I had the ability to materialize as soon as my name was uttered, in other words, I was a jack of all trades. That's what you call it, isn't it? Whenever rocks arrived in the factory, they were cut using these huge machines, same as big in my, as my house in Nava. The noise was incredible and there was water everywhere. You put on boots, it was obligatory and a plastic overall and some people even covered their ears with headphones. But with all that water on the ground and that stone dust in the air, it was difficult saying, staying healthy and avoid avoiding getting sick. Not just staying healthy, it was diff difficult staying alive or in one piece. Mm -hmm. From time to time, one of the workers operating the machines, those huge machines that broke up the stones like terracotta and sliced through them like butter, would lose a piece of his body, an arm, a hand, a leg. We worked long hours, sometimes 14 hours a day, and when you're tired, it's easy to get distracted. One day, an Afghan boy, a little bit older than me, came to me and said, What's your name? Inyatola. Can you play football, Inyatola? Yes, I thought I could play football, even though I thought I was better at Buzulbasi. Not that I'd played it since I left Nava. Yes, I said I can. Really? Then be at the gate tomorrow afternoon at five. There's a tournament. We need more players. A tournament? Yes, between the factories. Will you come? Of course. Good. The thing is, the next day was Friday. That's important because although life in the factory consisted of nothing but working, eating and sleeping, we did have one half day of rest Friday afternoon. Some people used the time to wash and some went to see their friends. From that Friday onwards, I played in the football team. We were all Afghans, as you can imagine, workers from three or four neighboring factories. There were t more than 2,000 Afghans working in the stone cutting factories. I did myself proud in those games as far as I could, though sometimes I was a bit tired because my working day usually finished at 10 at night. One afternoon, after I'd been in the factory for a few months, I was lifting a really heavy stone, more than two meters long, when I lost my balance and the stone fell and shattered on the ground with a crash you could hear all over the factory and one sharp piece hit my foot. It tore my trousers, sliced through my boots and scraped my calf, made a deep cut in the back of my ankle. You could see the bone. I screamed and sat down, clutching my leg. One of the factory foremen came running. He told me the stone was for an important delivery and heads would roll because it was broken. In the meantime, I was losing blood. Get up. 
the man said to me. I pointed out that I was injured. We have to think of the stone first. Pick up the pieces. Now. I asked if I could dress the wound. Now. He said, but he was referring to the stone, not dressing the wound. I started to pick everything up, hopping on one leg with the blood soaking my trousers and dripping out of the boot. I didn't even faint. Just think of that. I don't know how I managed. I mightn't be able to do it today. I finished picking up the scattered pieces, then still hopping, went to disinfect and bandage the wound. To do that, I had to peel off a piece of flesh. I still have the scar today. And for a while, I couldn't play football. Given the gaping wounds and everything, for a while, I worked only in the kitchen. One day, as I was going to do the shopping, I saw a beautiful watch in the shop window. It was made of rubber and metal and didn't cost too much. I'd already said, if I'm not mistaken, that I'd often thought about having a watch just to give some meaning to the passing of time. A watch that would show the date and tell me how much I was aging. So when I saw that particular watch, I counted the money I had in my pocket. And even though I didn't have much, I realized I could buy it. So I went in and did it. I bought the watch. Leaving the shop, I swear, I was beside myself with joy. It was the first watch I'd ever had in my life. I kept looking at it and lifting my wrist so that I could see the sun reflected in the dial. I would have run all the way to Nava just to show it to my brother how envious he would have been. But running all the way to Nava would have been a problem. So I ran to have it blessed at the shrine of Fatima al-Masumi, one of the holiest places in Shia Islam, and one of the most appropriate, so I believed, for blessing something that means a lot to you, the way my watch did to me. I rubbed the watch against the wall of the shrine to purify it, but taking care not to scratch it. I was so happy with my watch there was a moment when I even thought that despite the danger of losing a finger or whatever, I might stay home for a long time. And one night, the police came to the factory. They were well organized. They had lorries, so they could take us straight to the border without having to go to a temporary detention center. Repatriation, again. I couldn't believe it. It was really depressing. The police knew lots of illegals worked in that factory. They broke down the door of the shed where we were sleeping and started kicking us to wake us up. Get your things together. We are taking you back to Afghanistan. I was just in time to collect my things from the cabinet with the usual envelope full of money before they dragged me away. We paid for the repatriation as usual. This time, though, the journey by lorry was horrible. There were so many people that those who were on the sides were in constant danger of falling out and being run over, while those in the middle were in danger of suffocating, sweat, breathing, yelling. People may have even died during that journey, and nobody noticed. We were dumped across the border like garbage dumped on a landfill site. For a moment, I thought the thing I never dared to think I thought of not turning back, of continuing eastwards. In the east was Nava and my mother, sister and brother. In the west was Iran and the same old insecurity and suffering and everything else. For a moment, I thought of going home. Then I recalled the words of a man I had once tried to give a letter to, a letter for my mother when I was living in Kheta almost three years before. In the letter, I asked her to come and get me, but the man had read it and said, Anayat, I know your people's situation. I know what's happening in, in Ghazni province and how the Hazara are treated. You should consider yourself lucky to be living here. True, things aren't great, but at least you can leave home in the morning with the expectation of getting back alive in the evening. 
there, you never even know when you go out, which will get back first, you or the news of your death. Here, you mix with other people and sell your things, whereas the Hazaras in your country can't even walk in the street because if a Taliban or a Pashtun comes across them and takes a good look at them, he always finds something wrong. A beard that's too short, a turban that's not on properly, lights still on in the house after 10 at night. They are in constant danger of dying for the slightest thing, being killed because of a careless word or some meaningless rule. You should be grateful to your mother that she got you out of Afghanistan, the man has said, because there are lots of people who can't do it and who would like to. So I stuck my hands in my pockets wrapped my jacket around me and set off to find the traffickers. But this time, at one of the roadblocks on the way back, one of the roadblocks where the traffickers paid the police to turn a blind eye, something went wrong. As well as taking the money agreed on, the police started body searching us, looking for things to steal. What was there to steal? You may ask, we were all penniless. But even from someone who has nothing, you can always take something. I had my watch, for example. It was my watch, and it meant more to me than anything else. Yes, of course, I could always buy another one, but that wouldn't be the same thing. It would be a different watch. This was my first watch. A policeman made us stand up in line against the wall and passed along the line checking we'd all emptied our pockets. Whenever he saw someone behaving oddly or moving without permission or making that odd kind of face, do you know what I mean? The face of someone who's got something to hide, he would go up to him and stick his nose right up against the person's face and spit out threats and pieces of his dinner. And if the threats and spitting weren't enough, he'd go further and slap him or hit him with the butt of his rifle. When he reached me, he was about to walk right past me, but then he stopped and turned back and came and stood in front of me with his legs wide apart. What have you got? He asked. What are you hiding? He was 30 or 40 centimeters taller than me. I looked up at him the way you look up at a mountain, nothing. You are lying. I'm not lying, Janab Sahan. Do you want me to show you you are lying? I'm not lying, Janab Sahan, I swear. Well, I think you are. Now, if there's one thing I don't like, it's being hit. So, after having seen him hit the others, I thought I could keep him happy somehow. I had two spare banknotes in a little pocket I cut in my belt, so I took them out and gave them to him, hoping they'd be enough. You have something else, haven't you? He said. No, I don't have anything else. He slapped me across the face, hitting my cheek and ear. I hadn't seen it coming. My cheek caught fire. My ear whistled for a few seconds. I had the impression it was swelling like a loaf of bread. You are lying, he said. I threw myself on him, bit his cheek, tore out his hair, no, I showed him my wrist. He grimaced with disappointment. To him, my watch wasn't worth anything. He angry, angrily unfastened it from my wrist and put it in his pocket without a second glance at me. They let us go. I heard them laughing in the bleak light of morning. After that unexpected customs check, we walked for a few hours towards the nearest town. But by now, it was clear something wasn't right. Indeed, it wasn't, because a police jeep suddenly appeared, its wheels sending the stones flying, and all these policemen came rushing out, yelling, Stop! We all started running. 
they started firing with their Kalashnikovs. As I ran, I heard the bullets whistling past me. As I ran, I thought about the kite contests on the hills of Gatni province. As I ran, I thought about the women of Nava and how they mix Horma Palau with a wooden label. As I ran, I thought about how useful a hole would have been at that moment, a hole in the earth, like the one my brother and I hid in to avoid being found by the Taliban. As I ran, I thought about Osta Saab and Kaka Hamid and Sufi and the man with the big hands and the nice house in Kerman. And as I ran, a man running behind me was hit, at least I suppose he was, because he fell to the ground and rolled a bit and then stopped moving. In Afghanistan, I had heard lots of shooting and I could distinguish the sound of the Kalashnikov from the sound of other rifles. As I ran, I thought about which rifle was shooting in my direction. I was small. I was smaller than the bullets, I thought, and faster. I was invisible, I thought, or as insubstantial as smoke. Then, when I stopped running, because I was far enough away, I thought about leaving Iran. I've had enough of being afraid. That was when I made my mind to try and get to Turkey. Thank you so much, David. You're welcome. Bianca. So we are now going to leave Iran and we are coming to the end of this uh, session. And as I said at the beginning, we are hoping, you know, we are trying to encourage you to get um, connected with the characters and with the story. And I don't know how you felt, but there were some passages that were really emotional and you feel like one thing that you, you are there with him and then on the other hand we are still here in Newbury but there are people sadly who are experiencing you know this for real because of the situation in Afghanistan so we should be grateful for what we have um yeah so as I said at the beginning I am going to um give you a little assignment very simple easy assignment and we i don't want any facts no details we are not reading for you know for the detail comprehension as i said in the first uh on the first day uh so the challenge the the task is i would like you to list um one or two main characters and think about a gift present you would like to give them and why? David, can you be the first one? Okay, interesting question. Yes, Yata. and why Why did I give you this? We discussed it before. Um, so we would like to dig, uh, dig deeper into the personality of the characters. And that, I think, that's how you then become, you feel that you are closer to them. Do you agree? Absolutely, absolutely. So what gift would you... Uh, what character would you choose, choose and what uh, gift you would give them? I think I, I would choose the, the main character. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know whether he actually mentions his name or not. Anayat. Anayat. Yes, yes and by the way, I, we didn't, I didn't tell you, but David is a math teacher and a science teacher, so yes. <laughs> okay, uh -huh. so um, yeah, it's the first time I, I've read this passage, but it, it's really interesting, really enjoyed reading it. Um, thinking about the idea of a gift, you could give, I guess, a physical gift mm -hmm. um, to to Anaya, which mm -hmm. would be great. Mm -hmm. But I think more of a gift, the greatest gift you could ever have, I guess, is, is your own freedom. And mm. it's quite obvious that he was looking to achieve some kind of freedom mm. for his, his own security and for himself, but also perhaps opportunity to do better in life and perhaps to have an education so i would be thinking not of a physical gift but kind of some kind of opportunity or intellectual gift like education or freedom mm, beautiful yes and these are all the reasons why people are leave, leaving afghanistan because they want freedom and you know for the children they want education and a better future so thank you so much, David, for, for joining me today. And uh, so we will read chapter four, which is set in Turkey. If you have enjoyed this, if you found it uh, valuable, please share the link, subscribe to our channel, 
and we look forward to reading with you soon. Bye. Bye.